right, look, if you think you've heard the subprime mortgage story, you ain't heard nothing yet. Because what you're about to hear is both unbelievable and may represent the largest fraud ever perpetrated on the American consumer. 820,000 Americans have already lost their homes this year due to foreclosure by the big banks that caused the economic collapse with their predatory lending in the first place. It's true that some homeowners had it coming because they signed mortgages they couldn't possibly pay. But many, many more are being kicked out of their homes because courts simply want to process foreclosures as fast as possible, even when it can be proven that the owners paid their mortgages on time, and even when the banks can't produce the paperwork that they even own the mortgage. Matt Taibbi is a contributing editor for the Rolling Stone. He wrote the story in the current issue, and the title says it all, Invasion of the Home Snatchers, How the Courts Are Helping Bankers Screw Over Homeowners and Get Away with Fraud. All right, a lot to talk about here, Matt. First, let's talk about the original problem. How did this uh, problem start in the first place? Okay, way back in the day when you took out a mortgage, you, you were usually doing it with a local bank or a credit union, a human being who knew who you were and wasn't going to give you a mortgage if you were an unemployed drug addict because they actually cared whether or not you were going to pay off that loan. Uh, so that was where their credit risk was based. They weren't going to make money if you, if you didn't have any income. So let me just stop you right there. Because sure. that bank, since it's going to hold the mortgage, has all the incentive in the world to make it a good mortgage. Right. So it gets paid back. Right. Right? Okay. Right. So how did the system change? Two things happened. First, they invented this process called securitization, by which you can take not one mortgage, but a whole bunch of them, hundreds or thousands, put them in a big bucket, chop them up, and make them into securities. That uh, method allowed lenders to take their loans and then sell them off to somebody else on a secondary market. That was the first part of the problem. The second thing is they invented these fancy derivative tools like CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, that allowed them to take those buckets full of chopped up loans and divide them up into tiers uh, where you had AAA ratings on what sometimes were entire buckets full of subprime loans. It's complicated, but the essence of it is uh, you could take subprime loans and sell them off as AAA rated securities that were, that, and AAA means credit risk almost zero. So you took something that's actually worth very, very little and you sold it as something that's worth a lot. So going to those graphics, the second one talked about how bad loans actually got them more money. Since their bank X is no longer keeping the mortgage and passing right. it off to bank Y. Right. They're, they have no downside, right? They're not keeping right. the mortgage. So right. that, that gives them an incentive to make as many mortgages as possible. But well, tell us why the worst loans actually got them better returns. Well, the, the more risky the loans are, uh, the higher rates of return that they, that they pay. Uh, so that was the bottom part of these deals. That was called toxic waste, and that was sold out very quickly uh, to investors. But the AAA portion of it, this is the key, is that you could take subprime loans and sprinkle some fancy math on them and turn them into AAA-rated bonds and sell them off to people like pension funds, foreign trade unions, sovereign wealth funds and ultimately the taxpayer, you and me. This was a scam that involved taking stuff that was worth nothing and selling it off to investors all over the world who didn't know what it was. And it always, of course, comes back to us, and that was the third graphic, where we're the suckers. Right. Whether it was the taxpayers at the end or the pensions that bought into it, thinking that it was safe, when, and here's the critical part, when the banks knew they weren't safe. Right. That's where the fraud comes in, right? Right, so of course. So now they go to foreclose on those fraudulent mortgages right. and commit a second layer of fraud. Tell us about that. Well, after these banks sold off these fraudulent loans, and again, just as you were saying, most of these banks knew that this stuff was actually going to blow up. They knew that, uh, you know, in some cases there was only 1% equity in these deals, that people didn't put down any money, or that there was no identification, or that half the people in the, in the deals didn't have jobs or any, any real income. They were selling it off to all these people, uh, and now what they're trying to do is foreclose on those properties uh, so that they can... You know, now they've already they've dumped these loans off on somebody else, and they just want to get rid of these deals. They never did the paperwork after they sold them off to those people because why bother? You've already committed fraud. You've already dumped it off on somebody else. Why keep up the paperwork? Legally, they had to. They had to legally pass the note from one person to the next each time they did a sale, but they just didn't do it. So they're incentivized now, if I've got this right, to make sure you foreclose as quickly as possible because that means you can close up the fraudulent loans 
and and be done with them. Right. So that gets rid of your fraud quicker, right? Is that is that the main essence of it? Yeah, that's that's part of it. There's a, there's another factor here that in some cases they actually don't have an incentive to work it out with the homeowner because they actually owe their investors the entire amount of your mortgage. Uh, so if you're only paying 70% of, of the mortgage in modification, they owe that other 30% out of their own pocket. So their incentive is not to work it out with you, but to foreclose as quickly as possible. And that's why they're rushing it through the courts as fast as they can. Now, if you read Matt's piece, it, it, it explains in detail how some of these mortgages, they, they don't have signatures. They, they Some of them, the mortgages are made up. It's obvious that they're made up, right? There, is, so, there are amazing cases. I, I, saw, I saw one case where, where the bank actually said, we are the owner and holder of the note, and we have lost the note and, un, uh, and are unable to locate it. In the same page. <laughs> how can that be possible? Of course it's not possible. So, Matt, here's the thing that drives, I think, a lot of people crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So, we can see, you can see it, we can see it, it's obvious. That right. means the government can see it. Now, why is the government, as you explained throughout your piece, helping the bad guys instead of helping the people that are supposed to protect the consumers? I think there are two reasons. On, on the local level, on the level of these judges, a, a lot of them are retired judges who just are, are simply not used to seeing this. Back when they were active judges in the day, they just didn't have these sorts of problems. They never saw securitized mortgages. So they're, they're used to reflexively accepting the arguments of plaintiffs and banks. Uh, you know, they're used to dealing with the idea that people owe money and, and they shouldn't be in their home. So let's give a rubber stamp to the foreclosure. On another higher level, though, there's a bigger problem with all these mortgage-backed securities. The banks and the Fed, you and I, the taxpayer, we're all owners of billions and billions of dollars worth this, uh, of this stuff. But if we actually start turning over some of these rocks, we're going to find they're actually worth five or ten cents on the, on the dollar. And if people actually start investigating, we, we may have another crash because there's all these overinflated assets everywhere. We could have another crash, and then the Fed and the Treasury would have to say, oh, yeah, right, we were the suckers who signed on to this. Right. We we let billions. them get away with it in the first place. Exactly. Right. We bought billions of dollars of this stuff from these people in the, during the bailout, and we, and you know, we knew it was bad, and we bought it anyway. And they're never going to admit that. Real quick, last question for you. You're talking about fraud. Should some of these bankers get arrested? Absolutely. I mean, the only person who's gone to jail in this entire financial crisis was Bernie Madoff, right? But each one of these real estate deals was really a little Bernie Madoff. I mean, that's really what it was. They're, they're all these, these little Ponzi schemes, each one of them. Uh, you know, it's essentially the same kind of investor fraud, and nobody's gone to jail, and certainly somebody should. And I'll tell you why they didn't, because Bernie Madoff ripped off rich people. Right. And you right. don't want to do that. That'll get you in a lot of trouble. Right. You're up off a lot of little average consumers, huh, well, that's no problem at all, right? right? And that's the problem here, and we got to fix it. Matt, it was a great piece in Rolling Stone. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Are you looking to sue your bank for mortgage fraud or foreclosure fraud? If so, you should call Fraud Stoppers right now because we'll show you a proven way to help you save time and money and increase your odds of success. Getting, getting the, the legal, legal remedy, remedy that you deserve. deserve. Remember, when the banks break the law, we break the banks. So call us today. Until then, see ya.